Hi, I'm Eddie Conway. Welcome to The Real News. In breaking news, a landmark settlement will effectively end indeterminate long-term solitary confinement in all California state prisons. Within the prison industrial complex in the United States of America, there's widespread use of solitary confinement, particularly in what is known as security housing units. Here, the imprisoned are forced to accept solitude for 22 to 24 hours a day, and it is believed more than 80,000 people are held in solitary across the United States. Often, people are held in such conditions for imprisoned activism, that is, organizing against the same repressive conditions for other inmates. Here's a clip from a press conference about the decision. This settlement represents a monumental victory for prisoners and an important step towards our goal of ending solitary confinement in California and across the country. California's agreement to abandon indeterminate shoe confinement based on gang affiliation demonstrates the power of unity and collective action. This victory was achieved by the efforts of people in prison, their families and loved ones, lawyers and outside supporters. Our movement rests on a foundation of unity. During my time being locked up for 44 years for a crime I didn't commit, I spent seven of those years in solitary myself. Joining us now to discuss this are our two guests. Ann Willis is a civil rights lawyer from Oakland, California, and has been co-counsel with the Center for Constitutional Rights for this case since 2011. Marie Levin is a member of Prisoners Hunger Solitary, Prisoners Hunger Strike Solitary Coalition and California Families Against Solitary Confinement. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Okay, will you please just summarize uh, what that ruling that came down today means? Well, the ruling means uh, a number of things. One of the main things that I think we achieved in the settlement was that from now on, there will be no indefinite detention in California's shoes, um, the security housing units or anywhere else. And so the maximum term that anybody could get theoretically down the road is for five years, a determinate sentence. So we've eliminated uh, indeterminate sentences in California. And it started out by uh, our, our case had to do with claims against the conditions of the shoe, the violation of the Eighth Amendment in terms of solitary confinement, and also the whole improper violation of the 14th Amendment in allowing CDCR to validate prisoners as gang members and keep them in the shoe indefinitely until they snitch, they, their term is debriefing. And if they didn't debrief, they would die there because they never could be paroled while in the shoe. And Marie Levin, I'm sorry. What are the origins of Asker versus the governor of California? I mean, who filed this? That, um, again, is uh, Ann Miles. So what happened in 2011, there were two hunger strikes led by prisoners in the short quarter of Pelican, Pelican Bay. All the different uh, groups in the prison, all the different affiliated groups united together, cooperated in demanding changes in the shoe. And they, um, they, so they had a hunger strike. I came in as a lawyer coming up to visit them while they were in the administrative segregation, while they were starving and being blasted with freezing cold air. And so that was my first introduction to the case. Shortly after that, Jules LaBelle of the Center for Constitutional Rights and several other lawyers joined this effort. We ultimately filed uh, a lawsuit in 2012, uh, May 2012, which led to our victory today. Okay, so what, what is often said to be the impact of solitary confinement? And how is solitary confinement often used or applied? Uh, solitary confinement is 
the impact is great, meaning that the mind, the damages that they do to the men when they put them in solitary confinement, you know, the, the lack of um, um, sensory depri deprivation, you, you're not able to touch anyone. Um, like these guys were in Pelican Bay, solitary confinement, there was no sunlight, there was no um, um, fresh air coming in, no windows. So uh, they only got the air that was pumped in. They only uh, saw uh, through a little tiny skylight in the, in the, um, in the yard, which was all concrete. Um, the only time that they touched people was when the guards were handcuffing them. So. Uh, Marie, uh, well, how, how did you get involved in uh, uh, this uh, protest effort? I got involved because of my brother. My brother is um, has been locked up for 34 years in prison and in solitary for 31 years. And in 2011, he was going on the uh, hunger strike and he told me that he was gonna go and he was he was willing to die for it. For those that are coming behind him, he didn't want them to have to go through the same thing that he's gone through these 31 years in solitary confinement. So that is how I got started. I went to a rally that uh, they had at the beginning of the hunger strike and at that rally, someone told me the conditions that were in the in, happening to him in the inside. And I made a decision that day that I would get involved with making change in the system. Okay. Uh, and it, it seems that this uh, whole protest effort was a uh, collective uh, action by a number of uh, people from different races. Please describe the interracial aspect of this case. Well, there's an interesting beginning of that in, the, in the, what's called the Short Corridor Collective of the Pelican Bay Shoe, where they put, where CDCR and its uh, stupidity in a way, put together all the people they felt were the most powerful leadership of all the various groups in California's prisons, the different so-called gang and their affiliates. And so they put what they thought were the highest ranking members all together in a, in a pod in the Short Corridor. And over a period of years, these men became very close. They started talking about their, their families, their joint interests, and ultimately decided to um, to go on hunger strike in 2011, which, uh, and after that, they decided to go a step further and develop what we call, the they call, and which we, we wholeheartedly support, the agreement to end hostilities, which is a document which asks every group of men in California's shoe, as well as women, to step back, to not fight each other, to not commit violence against each other, and to work for the greater good of liberating themselves and uh, improving the conditions of life in California. And uh, I'm sure Maria would like to Yes, and, and as it uh, pertains to the families on the outside, she told you about the inside, but the outside, there have been, uh, it's African Americans, Hispanics, whites, um, Asian, we have all different races that are involved in in this fight to end solitary confinement. And it it, it was just across everything. It's not just family members, but um, activists, um, lawyers, um, just loved ones, just people, strangers, you know, people, concerned citizens, you know, just band together and to do whatever we could do to to uh, make a change. Mm -hmm. Well, can you describe the reach of this decision and how this was not just a case for those in prison in Pelican Bay, but how it has been designed to positively impact uh, those in prison uh, anywhere? Well, one thing is the lawsuit was specifically targeted against Pelican Bay because that is where they have no windows. That whole prison was produced in 89, um, you know, to be to be like uh, the most restrictive, the most secure, and the most basically violent towards our prisoners in terms of, of all kinds of indirect violence towards their human humanity. So it was focused on Pelican Bay, but ultimately this settlement that we've reached uh, covers all the security housing units in California. And so everybody will be impacted and they'll be stepping out of the shoe uh, 
every person in the shoe that fits our class will be coming out of the shoe within the next year, probably, you know, within the next few months. They'll be sent to various prisons to general population, or they will put, be put in what we call the uh, restricted custody general population unit, which will be a new facility, a pilot program where the men coming out of the shoe who, for various reasons, do not want to go to general population or level four prisons in California will be in this unit, which will be have all the uh, privileges of general population, but it still will be fairly high security, but all the individual in prisoners from these various groups will be meeting together, recreating together, being educated together, and um, you know living together as, as a group. So that's the model. If that's successful, and obviously it hasn't been developed yet um, on the ground, but if that's successful, I think it will be an alternative to solitary confinement in, in the United States, because it would mean that people that the system uh, finds difficult or finds who, who classifies as high security for whatever reasons, that they will still be able to have a more human life with the basic uh, privileges that they receive in general population in California's prisons, which means contact visits, family visits, telephone calls, education uh, opportunities, programming, and you may not know this, but in California's shoes, nobody could ever get paroled because they were in the shoe. Some of our men would have been paroled in the 80s, 90s, but for being languishing there in the Pelican Bay shoe for all these years. And one thing I would like to add to that is that these are people who are uh, 10 years, who have been in the shoe for 10 years or more. So that's that's a big thing from for all the California um, prisons for it to be 10 years and above. So that's, you know, that's touching a lot of people. It's not just those in Pelican Bay, but at other prisons. So that's wonderful. Okay, thank thank you both for joining us. You're very welcome, Mr. You're Conway. Welcome. Take thank care. You. Nice okay. to see you. All right, and thank you for joining The Real News.